Tonight I am going to be talking on the chapter five from the book, The Jewel Ornament of Liberation would be addition uh, or the, yeah, the addition being uh, Kenshin Prangu Rinpoche. And uh, this chapter, it begins on page 69 of my version of the book. It uh, is talking about the um, meditation and contemplation on the suffering of samsara. And the um, second obstacle to Buddhahood is attachment to samsara bliss, the pleasures of samsara. And so the uh, remedy is to meditate on the defects of samsara. Uh, and to also meditate on karma. Some people just want a better life next time. And uh, so there needs to be a remedy for people uh, practicing Buddhism, but with the intention that they just want to have a better life next time, or perhaps even a better time in this life. Uh, because uh, there is really no safe place, no place of refuge in samsara. And so we need to, as practitioners, understand this if we are to travel the path and realize our uh, potential. So this uh, chapter emphasizes that there is no lasting happiness in samsara, that the nature of samsara is suffering and that suffering isn't an accident. He says that uh, most people, including uh, many Buddhists, if not most Buddhists, think that uh, what is happening to them is personal, that uh, uh, to quote, Prangu Rinpoche, we get the idea it's mine and we don't want to let go of it. This is referring to when we uh, experience something pleasant in our lives. But uh, actually, uh, it's the experience of everyone Everyone has good and bad times in samsara. That uh, wealth or and or fame bring difficulties. If you uh, pay attention to the news, there are stories of uh, wealthy people committing suicide. And there are stories of wealthy people um, uh, having tragedies in their family, whether it be a spouse die, a child die, them dying, uh, just to begin with. Uh, there are wealthy people that go to prison. There are famous people that go to prison. that um, <clears throat> there are all kinds of difficulties that fame and wealth bring. And I'm not going to mention any. I should, I'll take that back. I'll mention a few. Uh, the rock and roll and the music industry is full of people that die from various means. <clears throat> a lot due to drug addiction, alcohol addiction, and so forth. But for other reasons, John Lennon was assassinated of the Beatles. Uh, 
um, George Harrison had someone invade his house and stabbed him. I don't know how many times he survived. Uh, <clears throat> if you are wealthy, no doubt uh, what goes through your mind from time to time, and it doesn't matter where you made your wealth, is uh, are my friends true friends or are they my friends because I'm wealthy and they are expecting me to uh, do something for them and perhaps you do do something for them because you feel that this will make them like you more. And so when you're wealthy, then it can even get to the point of, well, do I, or do I really have true friends? And you can get paranoid and on and on and on and on. And if you have a million dollars, you want 10 million. And if you have 10 million, you want a hundred million. And then you get into the billions and so far. It's a very, very difficult for a person to say enough is enough. I don't need any more. I'm satisfied with what I have. So uh, do not think that uh, uh, just being uh, a little better off or being a lot better off is a safe place. Again, Google the curse of the lottery. There are story after story of people that win the lottery and win millions and millions and millions of dollars and their life goes downhill after that. The only way to eliminate suffering permanently is to leave samsara behind, period. That is really uh, the introduction that Trangu Rinpoche gives to this chapter. So then comes this uh, traditional explanation of the three types of suffering. And uh, the three are all pervasive suffering. The second is the suffering of change. And the third is the suffering of suffering. So to go into all pervasive suffering here, that uh, basically suffering is inherent to uh, the process of existence. That uh, that's why it's all pervasive. It's a bit like uh, the air that we breathe that Fortunately, it's always there. And uh, secondly, we're not always aware of it being there. So we're not necessarily aware of this all pervasive suffering. So he explains uh, that it, this way, that they, we have three feelings, pleasure, and uh, feeling great pain and feeling intense suffering and then indifference uh, and denial. And uh, that uh, we can feel attachment or aversion to any of these feelings. <clears throat> We can have anxiety, discomfort, worrying. Uh, that um, on the other end, whatever happens is not permanent and stable, and this can cause even more uh, anxiety and denial and uh, so forth. Uh, even ignorance, if we're in denial, underneath it all, we still have this background of uh, the possibility that things will change. So, 
so um, that is how he explains the uh, the first type of suffering, all pervasive suffering. The second is suffering of change, and this is very simple. It's impermanence that uh, the good times, good experiences, good things don't last. And when they change, there is suffering. We expect them to go on forever. That we get attached to the pleasant and we want more. And uh, it gets so focused sometimes that we uh, don't even enjoy what we have. We worry about uh, losing what we have. And so attachment brings suffering. Even we can suffer when um, somebody that we hate uh, is no longer in our lives, whether if they die, they move away, we move or whatever, but we no longer have this person to uh, have our anger focused on or speak uh, with uh, derision about and so forth. And the third is the suffering of suffering. And here he talks about the six realms. And he starts out with saying that they do exist. And uh, the reason is, of course, that in the West, and this is, of course, an English translation, and I'm sure when he gave these talks, there were many people that were Westerners. Uh, that in the West, sometimes the six realms can seem bizarre and at best allegorical or metaphorical. Uh, but they do exist. And that uh, we've got the, uh, the two God realms and a hell realm and a uh, preta or a hungry ghost realm. And that these realms have uh, suffering in them. Trangu Rinpoche says, there are many things that we accept with actu without actually seeing them. Uh, Gampopa goes through these in great detail. If there was a full translation of this chapter, um, but basically here to sum this up on page 76 is a quote, the whole of existence is on fire and within that fire, all beings without exception are burnt. And that comes from entering the womb sutra. So um, the way this is not in the book, but the way I have heard and the way I usually teach suffering or another way is uh, the suffering of suffering is that it is, uh, we have one thing that goes wrong in our life and then another thing goes wrong in our life and then another thing goes wrong in our life and that difficulties and sufferings uh, kind of come like in a wolf pack rather than one arises and we get to work with it and at least accept it, if not solve it, before the next one comes and we get to work with it. That it's just one thing after another, after another, after another. Uh, and it can get very... Uh, wearing, uh, frustrating, you can get burnt out. I think this COVID epidemic is a really good example of the way I sometimes teach the suffering of suffering. So you have an epidemic and then you have everything else that is influenced by the epidemic. And now we are on Zoom so we started because we couldn't meet in person 
and uh, just all kinds of other things have come up as a result of this. And um, there's no doubt, even for people that have not gotten sick, there is a lot of suffering that is associated with this pandemic. So, uh, desire creates constant frustration. Anger creates disturbances. Uh, ignorance or stupidity makes the mind dull and unhappy. Uh, Prangu Rinpoche kind of sums up this chapter by saying that. And then on top of that, there are these uh, four types of suffering that the Buddha talked about, birth, old age, sickness, and death. To that, uh, Trangu Rinpoche adds grieving and lamentation. Uh, so the uh, whole point of all of this is to avoid trying to find a place in samsara that is free of suffering or to try to have a next life that is better than your present life. Uh, it is to develop the motivation to just plain get out. Practices like Medicine Buddha, for instance, and White Tara that can uh, cure sickness and extend life. The point is to do this so that you have more time in your present life to practice and progress on the path. So that is the uh, the discussion of the uh, chapter five. Again, the meditation on suffering of samsara. The next chapter, chapter six, is karma and its results. And this begins on page 79 of my text. So he introduces this chapter by saying that, well, we have Buddha nature that has been shown in the first chapter, but we're confused. We've met a teacher and have a guide, but obstacles arise uh, in terms of being able to follow the instructions of your teacher. And um, one of them is attachment to this life and uh, thinking that samsara is pleasurable and worthwhile. And so the previous chapter was the remedy uh, for that. Um, um, for uh, a, a, or I should say the previous chapter is the chapter on impermanence. Uh, and then the, the thinking of samsara as being worthwhile. So we meditate on impermanence and we meditate on the suffering of samsara to help remove obstacles to following the guru and to practicing. And uh, this is really part of what are called the four ordinary foundations, which is precious human birth, uh, impermanence, uh, the unsatisfactory state or the suffering of samsara, and finally, uh, karma. And that is what this chapter is all about. So when we understand karma more deeply and meditate on karma, it is to weaken our involvement with samsara, uh, to realize how cause and effect work and how to gain control of our lives, to realize that uh, suffering and happiness pain and pleasure, all of this, the source is causality or karma, and that we are the ones that create karma, and we really have the freedom to make choices, wise choices, 
choices that will uh, create good karma and to avoid making bad choices which create bad karma or negative karma. So basically we have uh, the choice of which seeds to plant. We have the source of freedom within us and we can eliminate suffering if we eliminate the causes of suffering. And the causes of suffering very simply is negative actions, actions that hurt ourselves and hurt other people. And then the karma that negative actions cause or uh, leave behind, you might say. So he talks about three incorrect views of causality. The first one is theistic. And that is that God creates everything. Uh, and <clears throat> this is God with a, uh, a small g in terms of, it's not referring to a particular God, but uh, any religion that has a creator God. This is basically the theistic approach, and that is that um, uh, nothing ultimately depends on our actions, uh, that God creates everything, God creates controls everything. Uh, some will, uh, teachers in these different traditions will teach that your actions are important in the eye of God or something like that. But it is still then God that makes things happen based on what your actions were. So you could say, uh, in this case, it's God as a, a judge that determines whether you go to heaven or whether you go the other direction, whether good things happen to you or bad things happen to you, uh, and, uh, and so forth. I have heard, uh, and there's stories in the Old Testament about God uh, testing the faith of a particular person through the um, suffering that uh, that person was experiencing. So this is the theistic view of causality. And uh, this is described uh, as an incorrect view. The second incorrect view is uh, nihilistic. And this is that uh, there is no karma. There is no cause and effect. That what we experience is due to our immediate effort. I, uh, I think a good uh, expression of this uh, approach is uh, uh, eat, drink, and be merry. Wine, women, and dance, and uh, so on and so forth. But basically, what happens is due to uh, our uh, immediate effort, or perhaps the immediate effort of other people that are causing us problems. Uh, that uh, there is no such thing really as cause and effect, that our actions have no long-term effect on us. And we don't have to worry about how we behave other than how it affects us in the present or the immediate future. The third is what he calls, quote, naked ascetics. Uh, these, uh, I had not heard this term before. I'm assuming that he is talking perhaps about uh, people in India that uh, 
uh, go around uh, almost naked. But this is just pure speculation. Uh, but this approach is that everything is caused by the karma from previous actions, that there are no other factors at play, that it's all karma, there is no freedom. Instead of a, a supreme being that's controlling things, it's karma that is controlling things. And um, so he refutes this uh, third argument by saying that things happen incidentally. And he used the example of having a string on his uh, hand and that when he uh, pulled it and twisted it, it caused pain in his hand. And when he stops, the pain stops. And he talks about thoughts. He says, thoughts can arise spontaneously. And that uh, we have the choice whether to follow the thought or to not follow the thought. To whether to grab onto them or whether to let go of them and so forth. And uh, so that's a kind of a clue to where he's going with this, this discussion of how karma works. So in, in Buddhism, the um, analogy frequently is uh, seed and fruit. Uh, and uh, it's frequently described this way. If you plant, plant barley, you will harvest barley, which is the main, uh, one of the main foods of the Tibetans. And if you plant poisonous seeds, you will harvest poisonous fruit. So um, this is how cause and effect works that uh, we, uh, he said he couldn't choose this place of birth, the time of birth or his parents, that this happens to karma. So uh, if we generate the cause, we experience the results. And uh, therefore what we do now will ex uh, be experienced in our future lives when the karma, the, the seeds or the karmic seeds of our actions uh, sprout, ripen and bear fruit. On the other hand, since we are creating our own future, uh, we can be more mindful of how to behave in this life and uh, karma can be purified too. He then goes into six points of the pattern of causality. Uh, the first one is classification. And uh, that is uh, negative karma is that which causes all our problems. Positive karma is that which causes happiness and pleasure. He also says there is karma uh, connected with meditation. He doesn't explain a lot about it, but he said this is when the mind is totally introverted and involved uh, in itself meditating. Uh, so he calls this the karma of immobility. But again, this left me curious, but I really don't have much more to say about that because he didn't say much more about it in the book. Uh, then the, uh, there are the primary characteristics of each uh, classification. And this is uh, 
uh, very, very standard in uh, Tibetan Buddhism. We have the 10 non-virtuous actions and um, uh, three categories within the top 10 non-virtuous actions. So the first category are non-virtuous actions of body, which is uh, killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct. And engaging in any of those will create uh, negative karma. And for the karma to be strongest, you need the intention to uh, do the action, whether it be body, speech, or mind, uh, the actual doing of the action, accomplishing it, and then three, rejoicing or being happy of having done the action. That's when the karma is the strongest. So those are the three uh, non-virtuous actions of body. There are four of speech and uh, one is lying, another is harsh words, a third is creating disharmony, and the fourth is um, idle chit-chat and gossip where uh, you're wasting your time, you're wasting the time of other people, and uh, gossip is always, by definition, uh, speaking negatively of other people. And uh, then the three non-virtuous actions of mind are envy, <clears throat> um, ill will, wanting harm to come to another person, Uh, and uh, the third is wrong view, and that is a feeling that the basic teachings of the Buddha are wrong. For instance, having a nihilistic view of karma, that it doesn't matter what I do. There really is no such thing as karma. And this is different than doubt or questioning. This is not intended to... Uh, uh, have uh, the student just uh, shut up and uh, not question what the teacher is teaching or what the Buddha said. And there are 10 virtuous actions and they're basically the opposite of the 10 non-virtuous actions. So protecting life is virtuous, protecting uh, the property of other people is virtuous. Uh, protecting other people from um, um, being, you might say, a subject of um, a sexual harassment, uh, rape, um, uh, violating their vows if there's a, they're a monk or a nun. Uh, keeping people that are in uh, a, a, a romantic relationship together. Um, here, these are some uh, 10 of the 10 virtuous actions, telling the truth, uh, maintaining harmony, doing what you can to maintain harmony. And this harmony and disharmony is primarily about within the Buddhist community, but to a lesser extent, the community that you live in and the world in general. Uh, and um, again, harsh words. If you bring things to a painful point, you are wrong, even if you're right. Uh, so uh, speaking uh, gently, calmly, with uh, soothing words, nice words, avoiding words that would, uh, shall we say, trigger another person. All of this is virtuous. Speaking about the good qualities of people as opposed to gossip, saying things that are meaningful instead of just uh, 
rattling on and on and on. These are the uh, four virtuous actions of speech. And instead of envy, rejoice in what other people have. This is why one of the seven branches of the seven branch prayers is to rejoice in the merit of other people. But it can be just rejoicing in the um, whatever it is that other people have that it, it's possible that you could be envious of. And instead of ill will, wish uh, others uh, that they are happy, harmonious, contented, and so forth. And uh, uh, finally, uh, in terms of wrong view, is make sure that you understand the teachings of the Buddha and don't hesitate to ask questions about things that you don't understand. Uh, the third point in this section is that it's very simple that the actions ripen for oneself, that we cannot transfer karma from one person to another, that you cannot, you might say, uh, dodge the bullet and the bullet strikes uh, the wall behind you or somebody else, uh, that you are the one that will experience the karma that you create. The fourth point in this section is strict result. And that is that uh, virtuous actions always bring happiness and non-virtue always bring suffering. And uh, intention is by far the most important part of karma. So we always want to have good motivation of motivation to benefit other beings. Uh, there is no other, other way around it. So this is sometimes divided up to uh, in this way, uh, and that is uh, white motivation, and that is uh, good positive motivation. And, but the, and the action is a white deed. You have positive motivation and you uh, engage in a positive action of body, speech, and mind as a result of this motivation. Uh, another possibility is having white motivation, but uh, in spite of that motivation, you uh, engage in a black deed that you are motivated to help somebody, but uh, what you do with that motivation is um, uh, a net, one of the 10 non-virtuous actions. Uh, that's it. That's, um, yet one, one example would be to, um, uh, you have a friend and uh, the friend is in an abusive relationship and you want to benefit the friend. Uh, so you go over uh, to the, uh, uh, the house of the friend where the partner is and you start a fight with the partner. Um, that's just one example, but there's just lots of, lots of things um, I guess you could say the Robin Hood approach, that there's a lot of uh, unequal distribution of wealth, a lot of homeless people, a lot of hungry people. Uh, so you uh, steal something from a wealthy person and then uh, donate it to a food shelter. Uh, that is considered a white motivation, but a black deed. Then there is black motivation and a black deed, and that is where you are motivated uh, by uh, any of the three poisons or the 
you know, so uh, desire, aversion, uh, indifference, uh, pride and jealousy, and then you uh, go out and behave and engage in some action based on that. Uh, you're mad, and so you just blow up in front of somebody's face and tell them what you think about them and on and on and on. Then there is black motivation and white deed. And the classic example of that would be a person who is motivated by pride that uh, gives a lot of money to an organization, whether it be a Buddhist organization or any other kind of organization. And uh, then they make a big deal of it uh, puffing up themselves and their own self-importance, their wealth, or whatever. So uh, these are important to remember that motivation is extremely important, but we still have to take into consideration these 10 non-virtuous action, actions. The uh, fifth point is that ripening uh, it's, quote, great ripening arises from small actions. And what this means is that uh, our even small negative actions uh, can have large results. That, uh, first of all, uh, a beach is made up of grains of sand. An ocean is made up of drops of water. Uh, so that uh, these actions add up both negative and uh, positive. And so even small virtuous actions add up. And it's important to keep that in mind with our, our daily lives to uh, engage in small virtuous actions as well as bigger ones if it's at all possible. But if, uh, an incorrect approach would be, well, I am... I'm waiting to do a big virtuous action and I'm not so concerned about the little things, little details in uh, my life. Uh, but also, as you know, and I'm just going to use the example of that uh, condo tower collapse, that it was a big action, but it started with a, a small cause. And they probably haven't found the cause completely yet, but uh, uh, but anyway, uh, it wasn't like there was an explosion and boom, like the World Trade Towers, and then everything uh, uh, collapsed. And the final thing is the inevitability. Uh, of our actions, and that is that unless karma is purified, it's unavoidable. Again, we can't dodge the bullet. However, purification can remove karma before it is ripened. And that is very important that we're not helpless again. We have the freedom to do something about it and the Buddha and uh, the lineage teach practices of how to purify our negative karma. The three skanda sutra is actually the words of the Buddha. That's why it's called the three skanda sutra. Sutra is the words of the Buddha. Uh, so it's very, very important to purify karma. The question is, could you talk a little bit more about the purification of karma? And there are generally uh, four parts to the purification. And this is uh, first uh, reliance. And uh, so you rely on the Buddha, Karmapa, uh, an important teacher. Uh, and you would then 
um, visualize that being in front of you. The second is uh, regret. I like to use for a handy way of keeping this in mind, the four R's. In school, you learned the three R's. Well, now uh, you're learning the four R's. And uh, so uh, regret is the second one that you regret the uh, a particular action that you have done and perhaps a whole collection of actions that you have done. And uh, it's excellent to regret all actions you have done from the beginningless beginning to the present. To, you might say, confess everything. Then the third element is the actual remedy and that can be a prayer, a confession prayer. Uh, when we do the nyungne, uh, there are a number of confession prayers in the nyungne. Uh, the main one is the three skanda sutra that I mentioned. Uh, but there's a short confession prayer too that uh, can be done. Uh, then there also is the Vajrasattva mantra. And then finally, the fourth R is the resolve to not do it again. And because of our habitual patterns, uh, it's likely that we will do something again that we need to confess. But to have this strong resolve to not do it again. And it is that way, little by little over time, that we change our behavior and purify our negative karma. I look at it in terms of the resolve uh, as a bit like you're in a, a rowboat and it's got a hole in it and you've got a bucket and you're bailing the water out of the, the, uh, the boat to keep it from sinking. The resolve is making the hole smaller so less water is getting into the boat and you're making some progress as you're bailing the water out to maybe even sealing the, uh, that hole in the boat and then all you have to do is bail it. Uh, but uh, what you don't want to be doing is having the water coming in faster than you can bail it out. So we want to make sure that our negative actions uh, are slowly, slowly, slowly um, uh, being done less and less and less and our positive actions are increasing. And so we're getting somewhere as opposed to in this boat that is slowly sinking.